So, uh, good morning. My name is Gene Foltz. Unfortunately, uh, Ronnie and Stark didn't make it today, so I'm giving their presentation. Um, I'm a rangeland management specialist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. That's the NRCS. The other NRI is National Resource Inventory. Um, and my talk is going to be basically about the, uh, the rangeland resource assessment, uh, the 2014 version that was just recently released. Uh, it's going to be in three parts, going to have the overview, uh, some of the highlights from the report, and then a little bit about the application of the data. So on the overview, uh, there's a, a larger NRI, which is a photo interpreted NRI, of the land cover land use across the nation on non-federal lands. Um, I have this advanced, but apparently it's not advancing on the slides. So, and I hit the page down, maybe if I use this. Oh, it's working on his computer. Oh. No, it's, it's just sharing the screen on the web apps. So. Uh, okay. The connection with that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the IT assistance. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so, so the um, uh, the dots there, the orange dots, are the total interpreted concept of uh, uh, lands. Uh, blue dots are the pasture lands. And the green dots uh, would be the grazed forest land. And these definitions were set up back in the uh, 1990s. And whenever you're doing a monitoring program, once you set up a definition, you have to follow that definition all the way through, no matter what the science or changes might come. Uh, so we have uh, 583.9 million acres of grazing land across the United States which is about 47% of the land area. And of course, it, but all of that is not necessarily grazed, but it has that potential to be grazed, or it has that image of the reflection that it could be grazed. Uh, this, the, okay. And so again, it's on non-federal lands. Uh, the NRI grazing land on site study there's a smaller part of that since we know the general areas and the amounts of rangelands. Uh, certainly, the sample is taken from those uh, photo interpreted images, and we go out on site and run uh, 13 different protocols, established protocols on those sites. Uh, we've been doing this on rangelands since uh, 2003. Uh, we started with the BLM and, uh, lands in 2011. Uh, we started the, uh, the pasture land on site in 2013. So in 2013 was our first year of having nationwide on-site uh, monitoring or measurement of, of resource conditions. Part of what Pete Busby was asking us to do with the original branch land health. Uh, several reports, the, uh, the URLs up there, if you, uh, the 2014 NRI range land resource assessment, you Google that. Uh, you'll get uh, the complete report. Uh, the uh, 2011 RCA appraisal, RCA stands for Resource Conservation Act, which gave us the authority to go out there and start monitoring these, uh, these resource conditions out there. Uh, in 2010, they did an initial report based on three years' worth of data, the 03 to 06 data, just kind of as a trial run. And from that uh, data, there was a publication in the Frontiers in Ecology and Environment that looked at these uh, local conditions, local knowledge, and ecological conditions on branch lands. Uh, different sections of the report, uh, you have the regional reports, uh, regional interpretations, uh, section on rangeland health, look at uh, non-native plant species, native invasive woody species, and then some of those long-term monitoring type of trends, the, the things that are real slow to change, which would be the bare ground, the uh, inner canopy gaps, 
and the uh, soil aggregate stability. Uh, some of the, um, it's a kind of an interagency kind of collaboration. Uh, Patrick Flanagan and Ron Lassar are the lead statisticians. So, uh, the, the black box, of, uh, we put the information in and it comes out. Uh, scientists, um, uh, Pi Carrick in Space, uh, we view this data. Uh, Fultz, Talbot, and Metz are from various NRCS divisions. And then uh, Dean Oman uh, does some cartographic work. And uh, Carl Wasser uh, does some of the GIS work. So the highlights of the report, um, just as a preview, um, there's tabular data in there. The scale of this is to the state level scale or down to the uh, EPA eco-region scale. And sometimes at a, a sub-level basis, depending on the number of points that are collected within those areas. So the redder, uh, the, the color on the map, um, the uh, greater potential percentage of that land is going to have that condition. The cooler, the less. Uh, so on rangeland health, over 80% of our uh, nation's grazing lands, rangelands, are in pretty good shape. 18.9% uh, uh, has a uh, rangeland health attribute condition of moderate uh, moderate to extreme, extremely total. So there's about 20% of that, uh, that land out there has those conditions where we really need to start thinking about looking at the management and there's some resource conditions and there's some resilience conditions that we need to be addressed. And of course, as a reminder, the, uh, the rangeland health attributes, soil site stability, hydrologic function, biotic integrity has those 17 indicators which is one of the protocols that we do out there on the site. Uh, the quantitative stuff, we've already collected the data, the quantitative stuff, so we can answer that. And again, this is in reference to the reference conditions of the ecological site description, because we're tying the vegetation to the soil type. And soil, identifying the soil is one of the things we do out there as a protocol. Uh, on the non-native species, uh, non-native species are present on 53.8% of, of the rangelands out there. Uh, the, the study includes Florida. You see that down the corner. Some of them in the back might not be able to see it. Um, but uh, the non-native species are not necessarily all that bad. Sometimes there are good non-native species that are out there. Uh, but this is a, just the presence show up somewhere in the data out of these 13 protocols that we do. So for the uh, invasive annual bromes, the cheap grasses and that sort of thing, they're present on 30.1% uh, of the land. 3% uh, of those lands has those bromes on it that make up over 50% of the cover. And so that would be one of those places where that resilience is almost gone. So uh, non-native woody species uh, down the red in Texas, mesquite, they expect in uh, New Mexico and Arizona, places where you expect to find mesquite, it's in the reference area. Um, so that's why it shows up in a brighter red color. But we found that uh, in four and a half percent of the land area, uh, those species are invading or they're there when they aren't supposed to be in the reference condition. So they're increasing out their slope. I also have it with uh, various junipers and a couple other species in the report. So uh, the bare ground and canopy gaps and soil life disability, this kind of shows up some of the regional differences. You see the arid regions there, a little bit redder, uh, where you expect to have wider gaps in the vegetation, more ground, and less soil site stability. But uh, the advantage, again, as you all know, on monitoring programs, the more protocols that you can do while you're out there, you can start comparing those together and coming up with some indications of what's going on as far as the health goes. That is, that is the amount of care. 
Uh, yeah, one meter gas. Right. Yeah, that. Is it. Um, so, um, operas, operationalize that principle of uh, collect once and use many times. Uh, so, for the application of data, it's used uh, for wind erosion, for the WIMO, uh, WIMO uh, wind erosion model, next predictions possible. Uh, the max down at the bottom one is undisturbed, and the other one is disturbed. So, you can start making those predictions about where you might have some. Uh, resource issues at that um, uh, echo region in LRA or state level. Uh, for climate change, because we're also collecting soil data as well as vegetation data, all kinds of models uh, and science is going into the uh, study of the soils and those changes in moisture holding capacity as well as what the vegetation is going to do. So there's a lot of uh, uh, predictions that could be made using that this data, that biophysical data, which helps feed uh, the basis for those uh, predictions and assumptions. Uh, rangeland hydrology and erosion model, the rim, uh, these maps just show uh, on the left, uh, yes, Cheryl's left, is the um, uh, conditions with the good vegetation cover. Um, the one on the right is whenever you have uh, uh, that vegetation cover might be damaged and uh, what type of uh, erosion is uh, going to be happening with rainfall. And it makes sense in the Great Plains where you have those th summer thunderstorms where you wobble to have that uh, potential for erosion. Uh, the uh, seed conservation effects uh, project, it's, uh, they use uh, process based models and they use to uh, determine ecosystem services and that sort of thing. Uh, so again, is that, that base input into those models where we can start manipulating things on up. Uh, we're also uh, gathering that data since we're identifying the ecological site that these plots are on. Uh, this, of course, does not uh, get the NRI estimates, statistical estimate. It gives us that uh, direct information for a type of land and ecological site, and possibly we can start picking out different states of the state and transition model uh, to start feeding that information. Uh, we're also going to do that for the board suitability groups. Uh, the um, NRI sage grass habitat, we're looking at the uh, sage for shape. Looking at the gaps and the invasive and the grasses, uh, we just started on some of this stuff. But you can interpret uh, that uh, wind shear grass is going to uh, increase, and, and it's usually whenever there are larger gaps, whenever you have less moss or uh, lichens on the on the grounds, and you have more bare ground. Uh, those conditions lend itself to cheap grass invasion, which leads to the fire return cycle which leads to the loss of habitat for the sage grouse and the sea shapes that clone and spreading, uh, which we're just starting out on, I guess, two or three years worth of data now uh, for nesting habitat potentials. Uh, so in summary, the, you know, this, this is a little bit boring, I know, uh, but after 16 years of collecting this data, uh, we just have one data point now. Essentially, we have enough statistical confidence uh, within 1% of some of these numbers. So the next wave, we started in 2012 going back to these uh, initial sites, initial points, geographically located points, to go through that uh, remeasurement process. And so the next wave will be trends, and the next wave after that is going to be a lot more detailed. And like all monitoring programs, all the money's up front. And then as we go along, we start getting more and more value out of those dollars. Uh, so much appreciation to the nation's uh, private grazing landowners uh, for allowing us to enter and take these measurements, uh, deal with a vast majority, a vast number of uh, private landowners with all kinds of objectives and purposes and recent uh, use of ownership. So, any questions? 
Uh, those are awful small. No, I couldn't. Uh, because this um, uh, this is out, I think, out of the, uh, the RCA report uh, that they looked at this. Uh, so it probably would be uh, times break. Yeah, yeah. Sure. How much similarity is there between the main protocol and the NRI protocol? Uh, the protocols are exactly the same, and we worked to diligently to try to even get the wording exactly the same. The uh, NRI on site has its own handbook of instructions and protocols, but uh, you read the name of the protocol and you go to the monitoring manual, and you're going to be reading the exact same protocol and message. The difference, I guess, in the overall uh, thing uh, between the non-federal and the DLM is on the non-federal reflecting uh, production by species, composition, on the uh, the DLM we're not doing that. That's not one of the protocols. So you're collecting more of that because you're also collecting everything therefore. Yes, yes. And which eventually will lead to a more complete map and you won't see that railroad going through Utah in the back. Yes? Yeah, so, uh, so I think the comment was that uh, one of the contract then we had the senior citizens and employees and private contractors out there for data. And uh, so that BLM is not, uh, doesn't go, uh, doesn't admit a place in the data with us, but they sometimes go with us. And so they are recognizing that the uh, protocols are very similar. So the field people are recognizing. Yeah, this is the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>